Happy Friday, folks, and welcome to another episode of Plan A Conversations. So glad you can join us uh, for today. Listen, if you like the content that we provide every week, please like, comment, and subscribe to the show. Uh, Now that we're on YouTube, our numbers are growing. The podcast community is especially growing, especially, you know, as you're able to have a video interaction with me. And again, we love our audio uh, community as well. Of course, you can find the podcast on Spotify, on iHeartRadio, on Amazon Music Now, uh, Apple Podcasts, and also wherever you just listen to your podcasts in general. So listen, I am so excited for today's conversation for a myriad of reasons. And please let me set this up for you. So over a year ago, around this time, actually, is when I was just in the thick of things with my coaching experience by being the resident wellness coach for Airbnb New York City Regional Office. And as I was walking into uh, my second to last meeting is when uh, the uh, participant said, hey, we're having an all hands meeting and we're afraid some of us are going to lose our jobs. We're going to lose our jobs. And so having no context for what was about to happen, there was one person in particular who I asked during that course of that coaching conversation, how do you feel about you know, what could potentially happen? And she said, no matter whatever it is, I will be okay. I will be okay. And that person that's joining me today uh, is someone who is more than okay. <laughs> particular, Amanda Stecco. Amanda, welcome to today's show. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you. And so for our audience, the reason why I'm inviting Amanda uh, to this conversation, not just to share the particulars of how uh, she has manifested this incredible opportunity that we're going to talk about, but also the journey leading up to it. And so Amanda, can you please announce for our viewers What is your new role? I'm the global social media manager of Nike football. Woo! (laughs) (laughs) So, all right. Everyone is, I'm so excited for you and congratulations for that. And I know people are like, oh, that's wonderful and that's great. There is a lead up story (laughs) to that. And I think... That is a story that we need to uh, talk about. And so let's back up, back up, back up, back up. Amanda, where are you from um, originally? Originally, and has social media, the idea of connecting people, and has that always been something you've been interested in? Yeah, I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I, I think, yeah, definitely. I had a lot of jobs growing up that were very much based on, you know, face-to-face interactions um, with people. And I generally really liked those. I love talking to folks. I love like learning the regulars and uh, that sort of thing Uh and learning the community. Um, Right out of college, actually, alongside my first full-time job, I was a barista in DC and I loved that experience so, so much. And it's honestly, if if I didn't have to worry about money or you know <laughs> skills or anything i would absolutely open my own shop bookstore whatever and just like embed myself in a community and just learn about everyone and be like an integral piece of it i really love that yeah you and me both i love that human connection and in my mind i'm like when i retire i'm going to open up a small coffee shop yeah. that's going to be the best place to go in seattle somewhere <laughs> and so what is it about for you amanda that that connection what does that do for you and have you always just been interested in people and their experiences i think so um i've always been someone who didn't really subscribe to like you know, befriending one type of person. I was that person that Mm. kind of bounced around different friend groups growing up, especially in high school. Mm. And yeah, I mean, even in college, um, I was a part of a lot of organizations. I typically always had no less than three jobs. Um, So I really liked, Mm. I would just, I just really liked being part of things and helping things like happen, making things happen, whether it was, you know, in my sorority or as an HBO brand ambassador on campus, or just like making people's (laughs) bagels at the Einsteins on campus and like learning their orders and seeing them. And they would get excited to see me as a regular. And I would see that, you know what I mean? I just, I really like the familiarity of human connection and getting to understand people on a, on a deeper level. 
Yeah. Talk about no experience is wasted. I think about so many folks who feel like, you know, oh, I was a copy editor for my college newspaper. Uh, I worked at, as I did, a tuxedo shop, (laughs) you know, uh, when I was in high school, which makes sense to kind of lead up to being able to support you to where you are today. Uh, What do you say to people who feel that maybe some of their experiences that they've had early on are premature? It doesn't count. It doesn't matter. Oh, everything is valid. Um, I mean, mm. one of my first jobs was at a uniform store in in Baltimore. Like, you know, private schools are very much a thing around there. And so um, it was called Flynn and O'Hara. And you just had to really be on 100% of the time, um, more so than mm. other jobs I had held. And I mean, I apply that all the time to what I do (laughs) now having to be on and having to really understand your audience. Like these Mm. were parents that for sure did not want to spend the money on these uniforms, but needed to because they wanted to send their kids to Mm. a school that they felt was best for them. You know what I mean? And you're trying to find their sizes and it's a very like growing up, going through that process with my parents, I knew it was a frustrating process for the parents. And so I always just wanted to try and make it as seamless as possible. And so I think the biggest thing that I've been able to take away from all my different positions, just just like the ability to have, have perspective of other people and like, and who Mm. you're working with, whether it's in retail, like I worked at a wet seal in college and high school and retail sucks, (laughs) you know, black Fridays were the worst, (laughs) but you you learn how to deal with people. You learn really, you really learn how to have empathy and, you know, that Mm. is extremely important in my opinion, especially in in marketing and social media to have empathy and understand where your consumers are coming from. You know, if they're angry or if they're really excited, you want, you need to learn how to connect with them. And so I take bits and pieces from every job I've ever had and try to incorporate it. So I think if people feel like I've had these jobs that are not related at all to what I want to do in the future. Like there's like, they they were pointless. It was a waste. It's never a waste. There's always something that you can pull from it. You just have to reflect on it, which it's, it's hard to do. Reflection is a difficult thing. And a lot of people didn't grow up learning how to do that or were never taught. Mm -hmm. So I would just, you know, my advice is to just really think about if there was like one thing you could take away from each job, then it was worth it. Yeah. It's kind of like there and then is lodged in the here and now. You ever want to know who you're going to be in the future, look in the mirror and see who you are today. And so right out the gate of of college, like uh, where, where, where did you do? What was your interest and what was like your, your first job? <laughs> um, so my, my degree is in political science and international relations. Um, mm. And I, I mean, I wanted to go into politics. I wanted specifically to go into the digital space of politics. Um, Really? Yeah, yeah. I, my my dream was to be in the Obama White House, and I never made it that far. But my roommate in D.C. was there, and now she she works with Michelle Obama for When We All Vote. So it's like very funny how things work out. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I have a degree of separation. <laughs> But um, (laughs) my first job was actually, uh, it was at this company that I think their name has changed, but they were a, it was, okay, the job market was terrible in 2015. I just Mm. want to put it out there. There are not a lot of market, (laughs) there weren't a lot of marketing agencies in DC at that point. Um, There, I think there were maybe like two that weren't specifically, Mm. um, like very specifically government oriented. I wanted something that was mm-hmm. a little bit outside of Capitol Hill and not not like deep in that headspace, but eventually right. around it. Um, so I worked for this company that was more right leaning. And um, I they were very skeptical of me, <laughs> obviously, uh, <laughs> because my freshman year of college, you know, I interned for Carolyn Maloney in New York. And then in Virginia, I volunteered mm. with Obama's campaign and Terry McAuliffe and, you know, um, Tim Kaine. So they, you know, looked at my resume and they were like, why are you here? And I was like, I right. need a job. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I feel very strongly about understanding all sides of things. Um, and so from my mm. point of view, I was okay with being there because I felt like I could learn about what I was going to be up against. Um, 
So mm. I did, I was an ad operations coordinator there. Um, and I mean, at the time it was like the digital version of stuffing envelopes, very boring, very like just yeah. clicking things doing, you know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, I learned a lot at ops. We didn't know how big it would be in social, you know, at that time, but obviously it's mm-hmm. paid social and, you know, uh, paid media is super important to any digital marketing campaign now, but at the time it wasn't Mm -hmm. as integral yet. So I'm glad I picked up those skills. Um, and you know, it wasn't, I think it, 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 if I were there now, it would be a very different environment. Um, this was like Mm -hmm. 20, you know, at middle end of 2015 on the cusp of (laughs) all things happening. Um, but I, I will say, like, no one, no one ever said anything about my political stance. Um, no one ever made any sort of nasty comments in the office. Um, mm. Was it a great work environment? Could have been better. You know, just, just like, gen- in yeah. general. Like, people referred to me as intern, that sort of thing. So, you Got know, it. like, not a fantastic work environment, but I was... I was surprised at how normal it felt for the the context of things. Um, yeah. But I left, I, I quit um, towards the end of the year because, you know, I'd never worked on ad campaigns before. Obviously, I was just out of college, but the amount of money being thrown at them was really distressing. <laughs> um, so yeah. I ended up quitting and doing the barista thing full time, which I really loved. It was very stressful because, you know, baristas don't make a lot of money. But um, mm-hmm. <laughs> at the same time, around that around that time frame, um, HBO, my contacts there, where I had interned in college, um, let me know that there were a couple of positions opening up and they wanted me to interview. So it worked out and I got the job offer like two days before Christmas that year. So, Wow. Yeah. And so not only was this um, a previous engagement you had, but you've built a relationship, you know, with that key people of the organization in order to, you know, advance your, your, your work. And at this time, did you know that you wanted to do marketing, social media, like that was your thing Were you, did you know that was the interest? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had been an HBO brand ambassador from my sophomore spring of my sophomore year of college until uh, the end of my junior year. Um, mm. so uh, I had been really moving steady on that, that path for a while. Um, and it, mm-hmm. it definitely did influence what I wanted to do out of college, which is why I wanted, you know, I loved politics. I still do. I love social media and marketing. And so I wanted to figure out a way to merge the two, but it's something that I think had always fascinated me. And I just needed something to put me more on that path. Um, my freshman year of college, I went to Marymount Manhattan College here in New York, and mm-hmm. I wrote a term paper on um, like the the cross the crossroads of uh, politics and and marketing, like civic participation with social media. Um, so I like this is something that has kind of always interested me in some sort of way because you know I saw how things were starting to change, like the Obama. Um, election campaigns were so freshly digital and that was something that we weren't used to seeing so it really intrigued me so yeah I think I've always kind of been interested in it but needed a a little push to get on the right trajectory yeah and then fast forward to a time where I'm sitting and having my very first uh, fireside chat at Airbnb this was also your very first day How did Airbnb, you know, cross your orbit and what was the impetus or the interest of uh, moving towards uh, that company? Yeah. um, So I was at HBO for three and a half years um, and a colleague and really good friend of mine, Carly Beltramo, had recently left and gone to Airbnb um, and she contacted me. I'm, it was, it was maybe like a month long process. It really was not (laughs) that long. Um, (laughs) and was like, you know, we have this position opening up. Do you, would you want to interview? And she knew that I was 
applying heavily. Um, I learned mm-hmm. so much at HBO. And as you know, we've talked about this a lot, but you know, mm-hmm. it was it was not a healthy work environment for me. So I was really looking mm-hmm. to move on to my next venture. Um, and Airbnb, it, it very much just fell in my lap. And I'm so, so grateful that it did. And let's 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 talk about that because when you first came into the circle, and I remember you came a little bit late to uh, to the to the conversation, and your whole persona it was one your your energy. As I was just thinking about this this conversation, you were you had a quiet spark to you, and it's almost just like you were sitting there and think of somebody who has all of this like electric. Uh, personality. They have so many gifts and talents, but it seemed like it was hiding behind a wall. And it just seems like it was just so many sparks I could just see coming out of your eyes, your interactions. And then when you first started to talk, but it was a little bit of hesitancy. <laughs> Who was Amanda then? Um, because every time we would meet close up to the year before you left, there was a different version of Amanda, a different version. Like who yeah. Who was she then? Um, I mean, she was terrified. She, uh, uh, I, I, I was fighting a lot of imposter syndrome at that point. Um, mm. Where I was at at HBO was it was a place where I was, my my confidence was just completely shattered, um, and it was it happened every day. So, you know, mm. in a being in like that sort of psychological space, it's hard to break out of, and it's it's hard to convince yourself that whoever made you feel that way was wrong. Um, mm. No matter what other people are saying, every, you know, everyone can say, right. no, that's not you, this and that, but it's, it's so hard to convince yourself of that. So um, I also wasn't used to, I met a lot of amazing people at HBO. I have very great, you know, friends turned family and this is not referring to yeah. them, but there are a lot, there were a lot of toxic people there. And so I also wasn't used to just, genuine kindness for no reason um something i I Mm. remember when carly first (laughs) left and i was still at hbo and i'm like how is it like you're out you did it and she's like they're so nice everyone is so nice and i was like no way you know like that was that was the big (laughs) thing and so you know she had told me she was like when i first she was like amanda like i really kept thinking when am i gonna hear like snickering when are when are they going to actually like show their true colors and it just didn't it never Mm. happened and I was like no so when I got there I was I was I was hoping that I would have the same experience but I was nervous you know like everyone is right I mean ridiculously kind and it is all very genuine but it's it's just hard to believe that because so many so many office cultures are not like that at all so it was it was a lot to take in, but in a good way. Yeah. And here it is. It's your first day. Everyone's going around the circle. They're sharing all kinds of personal things. And as a facilitator, I'm watching you, Amanda, and you're like, what is going on? Where are we? Who are these people? And, and what do I do? And then something happened you just let your guard down and shared some of the most vulnerable, just sort of truth defying moments of that conversation that just seemed to change everyone after that day for sure. (laughs) Yeah. um, I think I had said something about like, it had something to do with like friendships and like finding your people in the city and that sort of thing. I remember after it ended, I was like, oh, great. Everyone thinks I have no friends. Like, that's not what I meant. But <laughs> like, everyone thinks I'm the new girl, I'm the loner who is here. And it's like, friends? Like, one more time, please. <laughs> but um, it was, I mean, I I just felt like I, I had come from my own very close circle of people that loved and supported me at HBO. And so breaking out of that supportive um you know, community within that place and then coming in. So not having that and then not having, not, not understanding yet what I was coming into. I was just very skeptical of everything. And, you know, I was just wondering, I'm like, am I going to find the weirdos to be friends with? Like, I really want to find the weirdos (laughs) and, you know, everyone was a weirdo. Thank God. So it worked out. Right. (laughs) 
And the funny part about it is every single solitary coaching experience that we will have as the month went on and literally being there for uh, a year, every time you are a different person as you walk into the room. And what do you then say? Because yes, it's the culture. Yes, it's the people. But Amanda, I could tell that you were doing a lot of internal work on yourself because every, like I said, every time you walked into the room, it's just like you stepped up your vibration, you stepped up your words, your word choices, and how you were carrying yourself. And by the time that whole process was done, not only did you have a, a brand new haircut, <laughs> which was completely a, a, amazing, <laughs> but you were just a completely different person. What were what were you going through, and what was that experience like for you in strengthening your core? Oh God. Uh, well, the haircut was unplanned. Um, I, you know, I had bleach blonde hair when you met me and I, mm-hmm. you know, went to get a touch up and things went awry and, um, <laughs> you know, I had to make an executive decision to shave my head. Um, so mm-hmm. that, that definitely really messed up my confidence yet again. I had kind of started mm. to feel like that by this time it was, uh, when I shaved my head, it was the end of August. And so I'd been at Airbnb for a few months and I was starting to feel really good, like really, really good about things. Work was great. Mm -hmm. My relationship was great. You know, everything was falling into place. And then this thing happened with my hair and I was just like, God, can I have like one, like one time period longer than a week (laughs) where I'm feeling amazing. (laughs) So, um, there was a lot of, a lot of learning, a lot of learning how to, you know, love myself, I guess, because I remember I had talked in Mm. one of our sessions about just how like, trying to understand that I'm not my hair, and that it doesn't define me and that, you know, it, it affected my identity in so many different ways. Like being Latina, I felt like your hair is so, you know, sacred Mm. and having this long, dark, like wavy hair felt so, um, like important to my my identity in a way um and I think it's also because like you know boyfriends in the past also added a lot of importance to that too which I reflected Mm. on but I will probably the biggest reason is like shout out to my therapist (laughs) I've been in therapy (laughs) my whole life Mm -hmm. and I found an amazing therapist um in 2019 and I've been with her since we just celebrated our two year, you know, anniversary, <laughs> but congratulations. Um, thank you. It's, it's hard to find one and admit you also need one for a lot of people. So, um, without her, I would probably be in a very different place, but I, I did a lot of work in my weekly therapy sessions and outside of them. And I really, really try to, to take in what we talk about and, you know, apply it mm-hmm. to my everyday as hard as it is. But um, I think that is honestly where where a lot of the changes come from, just like learning to understand myself in different ways. Yeah. And there's so many people, especially in the black and brown community, who are fighting that idea of being able to go talk to someone, being able to have a, a therapist. What do you say to people who literally you have had this metamorphosis, this you know, shifting your life because not only, you know, have you done the work, but you actually went to go get the support in order to do the work. What do you say to people who are afraid of that stigma in their family or just in general to say, I'm in therapy, I have a therapist? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's the one thing that I think I'm, I'm very fortunate that my my parents never put that stigma out there. Mm. My, you know, they, they were divorced when I was five. And so, my parents okay. um, are both first gen and they they threw my siblings and I into therapy right away. <laughs> so they were very proactive. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. I am so grateful for that because it it helped us grow up with the idea that that, you know, this is your your tune up, you know, therapy is not like you need it because something is wrong with you. It's like you you go mm-hmm. to get your tune up. You go to, you know, have your tune yeah. up. I like Oh yeah, that. my mom called it yeah. a tune up and we all like all of my siblings and I, everyone, we're all in, we're all in therapy all the time. But it's, <laughs> it's, we grew up with it being a very um, healthy thing to talk about. It was never taboo. It was never, you know, wrong. And so that is where I, I feel very, very fortunate. And I know a lot of people don't have that sort of upbringing. Um, and so mm-hmm. to those people, you know, I, I would say that it's, 
it's like if you if you have an illness within your physical body, you know, no one calls mm. you crazy for going to take care right. of that. And so, you know, right. you should not let anyone's anyone's opinions sway you from taking care of your mental self. So it's it's a it's a lot of, you know, internalized fighting that I know people have to do, but it's it's all about trusting that that no one that cares about you will really shame you for this. And if they mm-hmm. haven't, you know, come to terms with it yet, they probably need time too. I I think like the biggest thing I try to be and live every day is just like having empathy for people and from where they come from. Yeah. So if if someone is really a risk averse to therapy, I try to talk with them about it and I try to understand why that is and, you know, talk about my experiences with it where there have been times, you know, like I've tried out therapists and I've immediately been like, God, I'm never coming back here. Or, you know, (laughs) I've I've reached out to therapists during really dark moments and they've said, oh, we're not taking, you know, new clients. And I feel just like crushed and rejected and it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And I give myself some, you know, I give myself a few months and then I start looking again. And so there, it's just, you have to really want to put in the effort there um it's i've learned through like past relationships and friendships nothing mm-hmm. you can force someone to do <laughs> um they have yeah. to really want to do it and be interested in it and you know understand that it's there's nothing there is nothing wrong with you for wanting to learn how to process your emotions there is nothing wrong yeah. with you for wanting to get some tools to help you do that without someone there holding your hand. Like these person, these people aren't, Hmm. there's always that phrase that people say where it's like, Oh, they're paid. I'm paying them to talk to me. I'm paying them to listen to my problems. And it's like, not really like they, they're asking the questions that you would never think to ask yourself, you know, and my therapist all the time. I'll be, I'll think, Oh, I got nothing to talk about this week. Like I'm pretty good. You know, we're, this is a good one. We're doing great. (laughs) <laughs> and, you, know, wanna, you mentioned something a few weeks ago I want to just like come back to that and like bring up something I mentioned in passing and I'm like damn you're good <laughs> and she wraps you know she finds ways to kind of help me relate it to other things that have been going on like these people are talented they are mm. sorcerers yeah and they are they they should be way more valued than they are because they take on so many people's traumas and help us work through mm-hmm. them because there are things that people don't even realize they've been through like it it's it's like the way that like I dated someone who you know would say to me well you've been through a lot of stuff like you you have reasons to go to therapy like I haven't been through things and I'm just like but let's dig into that you know like why why do you think that you don't need to go if nothing's happened to you like that's something in itself you know so like the way that you're brought up, everyone has things that they've been through, whether they realize it or not, that that have impacted how they behave today. And so I think that's the most important thing to take away from it. It's like there are reasons that you do everything the way you do it right now. And mm-hmm. some of those things were maybe due to like some unhealthy things that were happening in your childhood or in your adolescence. And maybe you can figure mm-hmm. out how to change that now by understanding where it came from. You know, it, it's there are so many different types of ways to go through it and go about it. But I fully believe that everyone, if they have access to it and are able to, you know, afford it should definitely give it a shot at least. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm curious to know what is one of the greatest benefits or gifts that you've received from therapy? Ooh. (laughs) Um, Oh my God, that's really hard. (laughs) (laughs) Take your time. I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, I have, I've learned to see myself differently. Um, My, Mm. she, she frequently reminds me um, that I'm very resilient um, or when I think that I, you know, I'm, I get, if, I, if I'm going through something and I tell her like, yeah, but I don't, I don't know. I shouldn't even be, I shouldn't even be feeling this way about it. She will, you know, say pause and she'll say, you have, you know, lost everything in the last year. And I'm going to keep reminding you. So you understand how far you've come and, you know, you yeah. understand how, how much work you've done to get to this point. Like this is, this is you, you did this. And right. so, 
um, yeah, I've, I've just learned to see myself in a much different light, um, stronger for sure. Um, and I definitely have much more admiration for me than I did when I first started coming to her. When I first started coming to her, ooh, a mess. <laughs> <laughs> the whole mess. <laughs> the whole yeah. mess. Yeah, and 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 that's the honest to goodness truth about who, you know who, who we are and the messiness of it all. But you know, you sought out uh, support for that. Um, but I learned to see myself. I learned to see myself. I usually get the title of the podcast based off. I think that's going to be the, <laughs> be the title. Learn to see myself. And so now, around this time last year, um, I open up my computer to do my normal talk. I had everything planned and ready to go to, you know, talk to the uh, the folks at Airbnb. And you all had a look of just sort of shock, a glazed over, you know, a look in your eyes. And I think it was uh, Christelle, um, the manager who hired me at the time, who said, oh, we might need a new agenda for this meeting. <laughs> and we... and you all just told me you're about to walk into all hands meeting and we shifted the whole narrative. What were you thinking at the time? How were you processing that? And what was the experience for you? Um, well, so at, at that point, I believe I had actually already been like officially laid off. Like okay. I had been told my end mm. date, but this meeting mm. was for, um, a lot of the the full time employees. So I was a contracted full time employee at Airbnb, mm-hmm. and so these were all of the actual full time employees that were about to, you know, walk into a gauntlet essentially. And um, I think I, I was I was just feeling so many different things. Um, I was yeah, I was really heartbroken for all of them because they were you know they're just like waiting in the balance there trying. To to mm-hmm. anticipate what could happen because they saw what happened to me and other contractors and couldn't believe that it happened to us. And, you know, it, it was, it was just a really unbelievable situation. And I was, were you guys shocked about, I know it was the, at the beginning of the pandemic, yeah. but were you shocked that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, so, I mean, I, I specifically was on like the COVID response task force and that's basically what social turned into. So all day, every day, me and other um, social managers and specialists were, I mean, just combing through all of social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, specifically around Airbnb and around COVID because we were putting together daily updates for Brian and the entire, you know, e-team. And um, it's a, it was a lot to to deal with day in and day out, you know, your, your job turns to all things pandemic related and mm-hmm. suddenly you can't escape that, you know, it used to be that you could, right. you could use work to distract yourself, but then work became the problem. <laughs> um, mm. So we thought, no, we're valuable. Like we're providing them with, with valuable things right now. They can't, they mm. can't do that. Um, and then they did. And, um, it just, it, it felt like a gut punch Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, contractors didn't get the same sort of safety net that full-time employees did. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Um, so there was, there were a lot of mixed emotions, um, especially after that all hands, when things were announced and people started to express their emotions, you know, that is where I was like, empathy, Amanda empathy you can have this because you know <laughs> there were people that were very upset and they're like how am I gonna pay for this how am I gonna do that and I'm like you got a 14 week you know uh I'm blanking on the word um severance package. package yes and healthcare. Yeah. I was like I, mm-hmm. I lost all of that and got nothing you know so and nice. I'm I'm just breathing here and so I I really mm. had to like pull the inner workings of like my empathy <laughs> teaching to be like, yes, I understand. <laughs> and I, I feel you deeper than you know. <laughs> so it, yeah. was, it was a lot because I didn't want to resent these people that I love, but I also, mm-hmm. I mean, I also wanted them to understand that like, you will be okay. <laughs> I promise you, you'll be okay. Like, right. I'm trying to figure out how to pay rent. I've got to figure out how to, mm-hmm. you know, get unemployment and, 
all of these other things, like you will be good. Just like take a deep breath. Yeah. <laughs> And that was the difference I remember now between the contractors yeah. versus the full-time employees. And I remember saying goodbye to you before uh, that uh, conversation. And in that, I would I asked you, like, how do you feel? You know, what, what are you, your thoughts? And you shared those exact same things. But then you also said at the end of that, and I know I'll be okay. Yeah. And I know I'll be okay. So what has this last year been like for you? Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, how long have we been talking? Do we have? <laughs> um, it it was. I, I would. I will be very candid and say it was the worst year of my life. Um, I went mm. through a lot of things professionally and personally. Um, my you know my long term relationship ended over the summer, um, mm. and that same week, my dog of seventeen years passed away. Um, oh, wow. So it was there was a lot going on. Um, and then, so then I'm processing, you know, I'm trying to find jobs. I'm trying to feel yeah. like I, I'm a Capricorn. I need to feel productive. And so I was trying to figure out just things to do to make myself feel like I wasn't just playing on the couch all the time. Um, and so then, mm -hmm. you know, there were, those were the moments where my therapist was like, it's okay to take a break. Like th this is okay. You need to take time for you. It's okay to give yourself this space to be lazy, be a slob, whatever. Like this is a lot happening all in a very short and concentrated time period. So um, that's what I did. I, I tried to just enjoy the time I had. I now I had this apartment that I used to share with my you know partner and I was just and my dog and then it turned into just me. Um, yeah. So. I just really tried to like foster those relationships that I had as safely as possible going on, you know, distanced walks or going on mm -hmm. runs when I, when I felt safe about it, I was one of those super paranoid people. Um, still am. So totally understand. Yeah, and so I just, yeah. I really tried to like figure out where I was going. I fostered a cat. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I ended up leaving New York because my lease ended at the end of August. And so I moved back to Baltimore for a little bit. Um, my mom lives in Arizona. So I went to stay with her for a couple of months because my dad is high risk. So I was just trying to find the safest place to be. Um, wow. Yeah. And so, you know, that, that was honestly the most uh, low key time period was when I was in Arizona and just, with mm -hmm. my mom hanging out there working every day. Um, and, you know, towards the end of the year, uh, my, my nonna, my grandmother, she had a, a stroke. Um, and while she was in Sorry, recovery, man. she got COVID. Um, and she's, she's good now somehow, <laughs> but thank God, yeah, but, um, you know, throughout the course of the year, um, she's one of three siblings and both of her siblings passed away last year, one from COVID and one from cancer. So it was just, and then my other grandmother's brother passed away from COVID. So there was just, there was a lot of, a lot of family dynamics, um, a lot of relatives, actually other relatives too ended up passing away a handful. So it, my family's whole system was really shaken. Um, and mm -hmm. my, you know, both of my grandparents, all both sets of them are from Argentina. And so the community here and in Argentina, they're all, they're all family to me. Everyone's a tia, everyone's a tio, like you're all connected. Yeah. And so it, it very much felt like our family unit was just really taking a lot of hits. Um, and that, that didn't end, you know, through the end of this year, my, my dad had to stay with my, my nono because he has Alzheimer's and can't be alone. And so he had to, sleep there at their condo for over a month while my nona was in the hospital. So, you know, wow. and his, his younger brother kind of is just not in the picture anymore, just does not help out. And so he's really doing it alone and he's dealing with his own health issues. So there were a lot of, a lot of things swirling that I was super worried about. And I'm, you know, I'm sitting with my nono with a mask on for a couple of days at a time. We're all kind of jumping in to help out my dad so he can like mm -hmm. go take a shower, go to work for a little bit. Um, there, yeah. So this past year has definitely been rocky to say the least. To, to say the <laughs> least. 
and 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 through that, you know, um, how have you sustained yourself through the ebbs and flows? And I mean, more ebbing than flowing, you know. But like, what 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 was it that supported you in in, in sustaining you as an individual, as a person? Yeah. Um, again, my therapist, love her to death. Um, <laughs> I've had her; she's maintained, and we've like. You know, when things mm-hmm. needed to switch up or we needed to like double up on some weeks, you know, she's there, she's ready to help mm-hmm. me out whenever. Um, but aside from her, definitely my family. Um, I'm very close with my family and uh, I've got an older sister, a younger brother, a couple of nephews, a stepsister. So, um, you know, alongside all of my, my parents, I say all because I have step parents, so there's a lot of them, but mm-hmm. um they definitely were a hundred percent my my backbone through through all of it. Um, I stayed with my sister for a few weeks when I was back in Maryland. Um, every time mm. I came home from you know when I was moving back from New York or when I came back from Arizona to then move back to New York, I stayed in Maryland for a little bit to get all of my stuff. And I stayed with my brother in Virginia because my family decided his apartment was like the quarantine base. <laughs> Poor guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I would stay with him. And so I I got this insane amount of family time that I've never had as like an adult. So um, mm-hmm. I leaned on them a lot. We, we talk every day, all of us, um, you know, right. My- and were you comfortable with just the flow flowing through? Cause I know for a lot of people <laughs> without having that consistent space and not being able to, you know, uh, weave through uh, the unexpected and to be present. It's a huge, huge thing well before COVID, but especially during yeah. COVID. What about for um, you? You know, I always thought I would be the type of person that would be like, yeah, I could do the whole digital nomad thing. I could like jump around. Um, no, <laughs> I could not. <laughs> no. I, I definitely need to be grounded in some way. And so that's something that my mm-hmm. therapist and I worked on all the time was like, how can I feel grounded as much as possible where I am right now? Um, so, mm. you know, I would... I would find things that I knew were very important to me and, and would felt close to me. So I would go on a run in the desert, like go on a trail run or go on a hike, or um, I like to make mm. cards for my friends. And so I would hand make some cards and just like, you know, get creative with it. Um, yeah. Or like, I, I really love doing my nails and like trying out different nail art type things. It just is very therapeutic for me. And so I leaned into the mm. things that made me happy and that provided me joy. And that was, that was the best way. And that, that was my family. And, you know, my, my friends, my friends were uh, unbelievable throughout this entire Oof. time period. They, a lot of them stepped up in ways that I, I'm, I still am like just speechless. at. <laughs> so. And it's a reflection of just who you are at your core. And so for people to want to connect with you and be able to support you, it literally is because of who Amanda is and the kind of relationships that you attract to yourself. And that's what, even one thing for our listener and uh, viewer audience, relationships are so incredibly important. And even just this is a testament you know, to yeah. that. And I could imagine moving through, trying to figure out you know, job and those kind of things. I try to keep in touch with as much as many of Uh, you guys from Airbnb as possible just to check in. All of a sudden, I am just scrolling on LinkedIn about to do, you know, my weekly post. And I see just this sentence where I'm like, I have to talk to Amanda. And you say, say what you want about manifestation and trusting in cosmic forces. But I have truly never trusted in the universe more than I do now. And you go on to announce your new role as global social media manager, Nike football. Where did that in the world, did that come (laughs) from? And why, (laughs) why Amanda, have you never trusted the universe more than you do now? First, congratulations (laughs) for that. But this is why I like, I I have to talk to her. Yeah. I mean, tell me about this process. (laughs) So, um, it, it started a while ago. Um, after I was laid off, I knew I needed to get it out there online that like, hey, I'm available, hire me, here's what I can do. Um, so I actually worked with 
friends and uh, former coworkers to craft this tweet that was like, you know, a highlight of, of me as a professional and also me as a human. And, you know, here are my qualifications here. You can contact me. Mm. Um, and I just pinned it to my profile. And right after the, the full time layoffs that got a lot of, you know, buzz and, and PR around, again, full time, not contractors. So um, <laughs> God, they got a lot of, a lot of, just a lot of buzz and, you know, great. Uh, but so the, um, so Michael Orenstein from Nike had tweeted about, uh, he works in Nike marketing. And so he had tweeted, you know, how sad he was to hear about the Airbnb layoffs and like, you know, he, he wanted to help out in any way he could something along those lines. And, um, a friend of mine, like replied to him and was like, Hey man, like I've been following you for a while. Like this is my friend, Amanda. And he, you know, pinned my tweet and it just kind of like kicked off from there. And he, Mm. he DM'd me and was like, send me your email because then I started to have all of these former Airbnb coworkers like reply to the tweet and vouch for me, which was just the sweetest. (laughs) Um, and I, yeah, I was just sitting at my phone. I was like, I'm going to choke on my tears. (laughs) This is so sweet. Yeah. Community. Talk about community coming together. I mean, that's the thing about all of the people from Airbnb. It was the first time I really experienced that professional community in a much deeper sense than I ever had. And to this day, I still do. Um, so yeah, it reached out. I, I, we zoomed, you know, chatted for a little bit and you know, we ended the call. He was like, right, let's get you hired. And I was like, can we get that in writing? <laughs> like, <laughs> official, you know, but that yeah. Part. And so he connected me with this woman, um, Jackie Titus, who I have like, again, she used to live in DC. We were there at the same time in the same workout group, but never were formally introduced to each other, which is just insane. Um, yeah. so I spoke to her last summer and it was very, you know, a really casual conversation. Um, and she let me know that they're on a hiring freeze, but they are going to be looking to expand the social team at some point. And so it was a lot of me doing that thing of like, Hey, just wanted to check in. Like I saw this thing that Nike did amazing. How is it going with the hire? You know, being that person. <laughs> um, and you know, I, I tried to do it like every, every other month, that sort of thing. Um, and then eventually in mm. October, Um, a recruiter contacted me to like kickstart the process, like do a pre-interview. And then the jobs were posted in January. And it was just like a very, very quick process from there, honestly. Yeah. Mm. So it it felt like a long time because everyone that always checked in with me was like, how's the Nike thing going? How's the Nike? And I'm just like, I don't know. (laughs) Don't ask me. (laughs) And the the interesting part about all of this, had COVID mm-hmm. not happened, who would have known? Well, clearly, the trajectory of yeah. how this happened would not have happened. And you even put in your post that this was your dream job, and there was a story <laughs> behind that. Tell our audience what that is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Nike, I mean, Nike's been endgame for as long as I can remember. Um, and... Yeah. Uh, so my my family is from Argentina, as I mentioned, um, and uh, the reason that I felt so connected to this role and that I felt like it was cosmic forces at play after a year of just utter shit. Oh, sorry, can I say that? Utter, utter of course, shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> terrible. Um, I, you know, to have something so good happen felt like there was. It was just like gears were connecting Mm. in my mind and so um my my nono um grew up in mar de plata um and his family grew up super poor um and so he his family actually benefited from a program that eva Perón started in argentina um to give housing to people in poor communities and so when Mm. he was eight uh he and his mother were invited to the pink house you know uh, the Casa Rosa in Argentina. Yeah. And um, I, he told me this story. I interviewed him before the Alzheimer's really kicked in. And he told me this story about how his mom was like, tell her you want a bike, tell her you want a bike, you know, cause she's going to ask what you want. And I thought it meant, you know, so that he could like travel to places and like, and work because that's what he did from a very young age. And he mm-hmm. told me, he was like, no, it's because it shows 
wealth. It shows you have some money if you have a bike. And she mm. wanted it to look to the neighborhood like, oh, we're not in poverty. We have a bike. And so um, he heard that and he asked Ava instead for a soccer ball because he really wanted to play soccer. And she gave him his first soccer ball. Um, he played in Argentina for years. And so did my other grandfather, my Zede, on my mom's side. And um, mm -hmm. when they both emigrated to the U.S., they somehow both like separately ended up in, in Maryland, in Baltimore specifically. And so at a soccer match in Maryland, um, I believe from what, my, what they both like combined told me, my great grandfather was playing soccer and saw my nono and was like, Oh, Hey, like, you know, you played with my son. <laughs> Just hey? I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but you yeah. know, it was like, Oh, I recognize you from Argentina and you played with my, my son. And so they like reconnected because of this soccer match. Um, and you know, my, my parents grew up together. They're only a year apart. So, um, Years later, they had me. <laughs> um, but, you know, th their kids would end up getting married and, and having my siblings and I. And so, you know, my Nono went on. To, he's in the Maryland Soccer Hall of Fame. Like, it's we're a very, very soccer-oriented family. Yeah. So, um, but I'm the only one in my family that's never played on a team. <laughs> so, because <laughs> I played field hockey my, my whole life. So I was a hockey person. Okay. Soccer was very much like, I'll play with you guys in the backyard. I'll like kick the ball around. But I just, I'm, my sport was at the same time as the soccer season. So I never played it. Um, mm. But it, yeah, it's, it's very much like part of our, our DNA as, as a family. <laughs> so it felt, yeah, it felt very, very kismet that out of like, they were hiring for five different roles. Could have been any of them. <laughs> Could have been yeah. any, and, yeah. And I got that one, so it was really great. Wow, this is one of those Nike <laughs> incredible commercial oh, stories <laughs> about how, like, I, I'm just saying, just putting it out yeah. there about how you know these two universes just came together. I'm all and, about putting it out in wow. the universe. <laughs> I, I, felt right? like I, I made a vision board, you know, when I started interviewing, mm. and it's actually still the background mm. on my laptop right now, but. You know, I, I read about vision boards and how you like shouldn't obsess mm -hmm. over them every day, but just put them That's in a right. place where you can like glance. And so it was my laptop background. And so I would often see certain things. I had pictures of myself in Nike gear and pictures of like ad campaigns and tweets and things I liked and headlines. And so I just I, I even edited my LinkedIn profile like I made a mock of it with the title of like <laughs> media manager for Nike. So, Brilliant. you know, my friend sent me, um, I sent it to a, a, like some close friends when I first made it just as like, look what I did. And they were like, yes. And so when I got the job, they sent it back to me and they were like, you made this happen. Like you did, you manifested right. this, you did this. So it felt yeah. really good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am so incredibly proud of you, Amanda. And what will you be doing in this new role? Like, what is your your uh, your function? I, I believe I will be leading up the strategy for all of Nike Football's social platforms. Um, so they Wait, say, say that one more, one more time. I, I don't think I don't I don't think we heard I, you say it one more time. The strategy for all of oh. Nike Football's social <laughs> platforms. Ooh. Um, and I mean, the Oof. team is, the team is very much in a rebuilding phase as they went through like a very big sort of purge of the company last year. So, um, mm -hmm. as they've told me in my interview process, this is like, we're all very much starting at the beginning here together and we can build this together, which nice. is really exciting. So, uh, I don't have honestly like a, a really deep amount of details, but it sounds like everyone yeah. is is really stoked to just dive in and get started on, you know, breathing like new, new life into these profiles. Yeah. Amanda, I mean, I really wanted to sit down and talk to you because there's so many people who just need a level of hope. 
something to look forward to. And of course, the COVID vaccine is making a lot of people really yeah. hopeful and those kind of things. But we're not hearing and really experiencing the stories of how people's life, uh, of course, the admin flows, as I talked about earlier, but how people's life could possibly, the possibility of shifting and changing for the better as a result of this framework of this craziness this pandemic has brought you know, to us. What do you say to somebody who is a listener or a viewer who is sitting, they're, they're sitting and they're, they're wondering how they're going to pay their bills. They're wondering what, you know, how are they going to take care of their, their rent and they, they lost their job and throughout the pandemic. How do, what, what do you say to them? Cause you're a testament to what the possibility could be. <laughs> I feel like whatever I'm going to say is like super cliche <laughs> that people hear all the time. Hey, but... let's just, no, it, it, but it's, it's uniquely, it'll be uniquely you. Sure. So go ahead. I mean, I, I, I just, I, I just kept going. <laughs> I don't really even know like mm. how else mm. to put it. I, um, I knew that there was something else out there for me because it had happened once before. And if I, if I could get through that, then what else is there? Um, I, uh. I think especially after this year, um, I no longer have to look ahead or imagine what it looks like to get through something I can now look back and see how I got through things and like yeah I did this so I'll do it again and again and again because the other shoe will always drop there will always be something um and so I can't sit around and like be tense and wait for it to happen and get you know crumble from that I have to just look back and be like okay I already went through that one thing how can I get through this other thing because if I got through that and there's nothing else I can't do. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, you just have to, like, l take cues from yourself because there are, there are probably more there than people realize. You don't often see it. But the fact that you continue to wake up every day and find a way to pay the bills, find a way to to take a shower, like, that's huge. The days that the days that I got up and did those things, like those are wins that should be celebrated because they're really, really hard when you're stuck in these places, you know, just feeding yourself or charging your phone. Like the the smallest things, it, they're they're really difficult. So, you know, congratulate yourself on the small things and soon those small things will grow to be even bigger things that you start to feel really proud of yourself for. And there you have it, folks, Amanda Stacco with a masterclass <laughs> on resiliency, on empathy, self-care, the power of therapy, the power of never giving up, relationships, family, and the list just goes on and on and on. Amanda, where can people connect with you if they want to learn more about you and also follow all the cool things you're going to be doing with Nike? Yeah, um, they can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I think I'm like amanda.stecco1 I want to say okay. <laughs> uh, my Instagram is amstecco um, you can definitely find me there um, that's where I connect with most people honestly um, yeah those are all the places find me talk to me I, I love talking about this sort of stuff so I'm very open to any sort of questions or conversations people want to have Amanda, listen, I, I I am so incredibly proud of you. Like I said before, talk about a full circle moment from meeting you a year before and then coming to this point today and just seeing the beautiful, like just uh, like flowering that you have experienced and being able to weather the storm. Like I am so incredibly proud of you and I really hope that you know you're a huge 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 inspiration to so many of us and uh, we love you and just thank you so much for this thank time. Thank you so much Clay that means a lot. I could not have done a lot of this stuff this year without your help and your assistance in finding those parts of myself so I appreciate the support. 
Yeah, always, always. Listen, folks, so I'll have all of Amanda's information at the base of the podcast where you can learn and connect more with her. Uh, just another fun announcement. As you know, Mike Simone was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. We we're talking about this mental fitness project. It kicks off on Sunday. So be sure to follow uh, my social media at Plan A with Clay and, of course, at Human Fit Project so you can learn about the importance of mental fitness. Um, you can learn more about me by visiting ClaySWilliams.com. And I'm on all your favorite social media by the handle of at Plan A with Clay. That's at Plan A with Clay. Folks, remember, Clay is with a K. Thanks for listening. I look forward to seeing you in our very next episode of Plan A Conversations.